world is shaken by the ongoing 19 COVID-19 pandemic. It has become apparent that our rulers could not stop this invisible threat with their power. Our science could not find the remedy to fight this virus. All our human resources have failed us and have led us to the most helpless and desperate situation. At this hour, there is a hope. God says that I am your hope. Let us put our trust in God. Continue to be with the suffering people. Let us pray. Gracious and loving parent God, we come before you, throne of grace, beseeching your help and support. Without you, we can do nothing. Our eyes are focused on you. You alone can help us at this most difficult situation. We seek your healing touch upon the suffering humanity. We have the assurance that you alone can revive us. You alone can change this hard situation in split second. May your grace be on each one of us. At this juncture, we seek your blessings for all of us who are joining in this webinar. Be with all of us. Help us to understand. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Thank you so much, Bishop Tadigaru. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so much delighted to introduce our ECC Director, Professor Father Dr. Matthew Chandran Kunal. He's a scientist and a Catholic priest. At present, he's the director of our Ecumenical Christian Center, Whitefield, Bengaluru. Professor Father Matthew received a PhD doctorate from Faculty of Philosophy, University of Leuven, Belgium. He has also completed postdoctoral research from Harvard University. His subject is quantum physics, philosophy of science. He has written a number of articles and books and delivered profound lectures in many universities around the world. I cordially invite Professor Father Dr. Matthew Chandran Kunel to welcome the gathering. Right Reverend Dr. Sharma Nityanandam, Bishop of Vellur Diocese of the Church of South India, Advocate Fernandez, General Secretary of the Church of South India, Reverend Dr. C. David Joy, Principal of KUTS Trivandrum, Professor Dr. Johnson Thomas Kuti, Reverend uh, Nova, Executive Committee Member of ECC, Reverend Pastors, Professors, and my dear friends. I am extremely happy to welcome all of you for this wonderful webinar, series of conferences on wider contextualized biblical hermeneutics. It was a dream to come together as an ecumenical body. And today I see that, you know, already there are 82 participants and we have people from all different Christian denominations. And the support and also the care given by the Church of South India I must say that it was splendid. And as Christian disciples who are living in the hope of the resurrection, it is our duty to witness and to proclaim the good news. And this is a great opportunity for us to come together. If we were coming together, Maybe at least 30 or 40 people will be here in reality, but in virtuality, we are able to come together. See, from all over the world, there are people from states, there are people from uh, United Kingdom, maybe from uh, Europe, so uh, from the whole of India. And it is said that, you know, when there is darkness, you will see the stars. 
so we are as our bishop was saying that you know it is a difficult time but this difficult time made us to come together so i must uh, thank also i must welcome all of you for this enthusiastic um, coming together we have already uh, 90 um, uh, participants and i am sure that within 10 minutes there will be much more uh, what we can hold and maybe we have to expand it to more than uh, 100 to 200 so it is an overwhelming and wonderful uh, enthusiastic enthusiastic uh, coming together from all the churches so first of all um, i want to welcome uh, especially the the bishop um, uh, of Velur Sharma Nityanandam and uh, very specially Advocate Fernandez, uh, who is the uh, General Secretary of the Church of South India, almost uh, 4 million people uh, belonging to the Church of South India, uh, 28 uh, dioceses, and uh, who, uh, the church is doing wonderful service in relating uh, to the uh, downtrodden, oppressed, and uh, having great uh, educational uh, services so in the forefront of our, of our christian witnessing as a lay person i think that uh, he is the uh, apt person to inaugurate uh, this section and uh, also we have uh, from the uh, the principal of KUTS from Trivandrum uh, to give us uh, the first introductory uh, lecture and also from the ECC, we have um, uh, Reverend Nova and uh, uh, many other pastors, uh, professors and friends, all of you are together. So uh, this dream of coming together in witnessing the good news. I welcome you and also wish you all the best. This is not uh, just one, but we have almost 25 uh, uh, series of uh, lectures. And uh, I wish you all the best. This is a great dream a dream of coming together and uh, this is able to be uh, because of uh, the generosity of the csi church and i also thank for this very enthusiastic uh, coming together so over to uh, sukumar thank you so much for that let me introduce advocate c fernandez ratnaraja he is the general secretary of church of south india synod chennai Advocate C. Fernandez Ratnaraja comes from very historical diocese by name Madurai Ramana Diocese in Church of South India, which was founded by the Madurai Mission Sangam in 1934. I salute Madurai Ramana Diocese for producing a dynamic and dedicated person by name Advocate C. Fernandez Ratnaraja. He is a leader with a vision in the Diocese of Madurai Ramnad. Thank you so much, sir, for joining with us. We are honored to have you with us. I invite Advocate C. Fernandez Ratharaja to give inaugural address or to Advocate Fernandez Ratharaja. Sir, unmute, unmute, please. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening to you all. I am glad to greet you in the name of Lord Jesus Christ. Indeed, it is a great effort taken by the Ecumenical Christian Center and Church of South India to organize this online Bible study series. I take this time to congratulate the director and the team involved on this timely effort of making available to the people during this time of pandemic. I also thank the director for inviting me in the midst of the galaxy of theologians and he invited me to inaugurate this series of lecture wider contextualized hermeneutics we are aware that there is a great need for studying the bible rightly and drawing out the correct meaning of this scripture passage i thank god for giving such a perfect vision to my fellow brothers many times the message of the bible is misinterpreted for ulterior purposes in the context of people wrongly interpreting the Bible, I am fully convinced that the Bible study and lectures delivered by learned theologians would bring out the originally intended message of the Bible passages. 
as we all know bible is a prime source in which god reveals his eternal plan for mankind the prime responsibility of each child of god is to know god's will for his or her life at this requires a daily intake of knowledge about him through the word of god studying bible is an amazing act which is beneficial for this world and the world to come giving priority and dedicating time on this always fruitful we are absolutely blessed to have god's word in our own language even though we when we read bible in our own language we need to understand properly in acts chapter 8 verses 26 onwards we read about philip and an ethiopian officer philip asked the officer do you understand what you are reading and the answer was how can i understand unless a man guides me here we see two persons one who knows the word of god explains it and the other one who wants to know is ready to read and listen i would like to provide few suggestions to the team and the learners the learners will be from different walks of life they will be distinct in terms of their religious background cultural background economical background and social background sharing and serving according to their need is further challenging as the mode of teaching is going to be online in future my suggestion would be including the topics such as family life education management leadership and care and counseling understanding human psychology would help the learners to understand the social life in a better manner i would also like to suggest few points to the learners studying bible is the highest act a christian can do because it is a desire to know about our creator bible reading and bible studying are two different styles if bible reading is like gathering dry leaves studying bible is like digging for diamonds our christian life needs both as we are part in god's eternal plan understanding our roles and responsibilities is vital this understanding comes only by studying bible like the ethiopian officer one who wants to learn the word of god should be an honest inquirer should be a good listener should be obedient and should be responsive if you are sincere in this effort we shall be enlightened by the word of god we shall be deeply convinced in the word of god and we shall be rejoicing in it with these words i inaugurate the series of lectures i once again thank the organizers for coming forward to share their knowledge and wisdom to the congregation members i am sure that the organizers would have heard the voice of god arise and go as philip heard i pray that these lectures will enhance the understanding of bible especially during this difficult time the world is facing may god bless the novel initiative thank you thank you so much sir it was fantastic let me introduce reverend nova vasant kumar he is an ordained priest from church of south india reverend nova vasant kumar is also an executive member of ecumenical christian center thank you so much first pastor for joining with us we are honored to have you with us i cordially invite reverend nova vasant kumar to felicitate the gathering or to reverend nova vasant kumar thank you on behalf of acc uh, and csi i greet you all in the precious name of our lord and savior jesus christ we are filled with joy as we stand together offering our most sincere thanks and praise to our god almighty some may wonder about the importance of studying the bible god is holding all things by the word of his power he is all his mighty his greatness no one can fathom our god is our creator and our redeemer forever he is god over all doesn't he deserve to be known better shouldn't the one who serve him seek to serve him more effectively everyone who chooses to work as an assistant to a barber must be trained for the position at the university you need three 
years for a bachelor's degree and two or three years for a masters and another additional two or three years for phd and yet why do some people believe they can serve the lord without study and proper vocation the lord himself trained his disciples for three and a half years in a city is very important to cultivate the habit of bible study which in turn will help us to get molded into a proper human being the world is raising difficult questions people have opened up to many things and life has gotten complicated atheism is growing and temptations and the distractions are arising from every direction the gospel must be delivered honestly and with simplicity its relevance must be demonstrated we must address the issues that are driving people away from the lord and meet them where they are in the busy rush of their lives we need equip christian leaders in this world ecc is formed by merging many churches with different denominations of same faith in a time when we see a lot of division within the church the lord performed a miracle when he brought the representatives of different church denominations under the same umbrella known as ecc unity is so pleasing to the heart of the lord the lord gave me the privilege to serve in ecc while i am a member of executive committee ecc is not only the core of our ecumenical lives but it plays an important role in our society because it is a centered in a local context and is a part of the community so i extend my heartfelt congratulations to all the members of ecc and csi may god bless each one of us and make this series of bible study a grand success thank you thank you so much pastor let me introduce professor reverend dr david joy professor reverend dr david joy is the principal of kerala united theological seminary trivandrum professor reverend dr david joy is an ordained presbyter from south kerala diocese he has a completed phd doctorate from university of birmingham england he taught number of years as a professor of the new testament in the united theological college bangalore he has published number of books and articles he has presented number of scholarly papers in different parts of the world in fact he is one of my heroes my mentor my tutor he lifted me what i am today professor dr david joy has two sons ashwin completed his doctorate from fine arts from university of east london and second son anbin graduated from christ university thank you so much sir for joining with us i cordially invite you to give keynote address over to professor reverend dr david joy respected father matthew chandra gunnel director of ecumenical christian center right reverend bishop sharma advocate fernandez general secretary of csi dr johnson thomas kutty the coordinator of this program and reverend sugumar babu architect of the series of lectures when i see all indian new testament scholars gathered under one umbrella today evening i am nervous i am i am nervous not because of the presence of senior friends like bishop or dr pc gaye or others but because of the presence of my own students when i see 100 people i was counting around the 50 55 of 
those are present here, the Mayon students. At some point, I have learned from you. <laughs> Not I have taught you, but I have learned from you. Therefore, it's an emotional moment for me to give the inaugural lecture entitled Principles and Methods of Reading the New Testament. As a couple of you have already mentioned, this is not a time of a kind of entertainment or leisure reading, but it's a time of serious study. Serious study in terms of understanding where the New Testament scholar the scholarship stands today in India. When I make these comments, I should be presenting the wider framework of the biblical scholarship in the current scenario, namely the Indian Christian context. It is not exactly like the world scholarship, but Indian biblical scholarship has been unique and typical. Unique and typical in the sense it's been associated with the scholarship and the study promoted by the church. There is no dichotomy between biblical scholarship and ecclesial scholarship as far as India is concerned. Those of us who have some kind of exposure to the West and Western Academy know very well that it West, it is more or less a kind of professional practice, whereas in India, we do not distinguish Indian Biblical or New Testament scholarship from the mainland or mainstream ecclesial scholarship. Let me uh, take this in a systematic way. First part of my lecture, I may take about seven, eight minutes to describe what is the present uh, context within which we practice biblical reading, particularly New Testament reading. And the very basic context that we face today is the context of changing world order. Changing world order, to put it in black and white, the world exploits people who are migrants, who are seeking for job, who are nowhere, who are the people of the land but not given the real status, and the people who are rejected by their own country. And that's the real context now, not only in India, but in all other parts of the world, we face the rejected people, the ignored people, the forgotten people. And when we read New Testament, that should come very, very clearly in terms of understanding the context quite well. Second aspect is the themes. After careful reading, churches propose and promote. This is, I know, uh, done in collaboration with the Church of South India and Ecumenical Christian Center. Of course, Church of South India every year proposes a theme. Last year, one of the Catholic dioceses in, in Kerala proposed a theme for their study, congregational study. Uh, theme was quite uh, fascinating. A phrase taken from the New Testament, unusual kindness. And uh, first sight, we, we are fascinated by the theme. But then that phrase is used to say that what we do in the name of the ecclesial order, it's all unusual kindness, which is not. So that 
theological themes, the biblical themes that we propose uh, in the Indian church also constitute a kind of context. And the third dimension is anything for everything, we ask for biblical response. COVID-19, what is the biblical response? Tsunami, we ask for the biblical response. It's ecclesial election, we ask for biblical response. Ecumenism, we ask for biblical response. So whether that is necessary is a big question. But that's the context we live. We uphold the authority of the Bible, and then we derive meaning and insight to move forward by taking points from the Bible. And the fourth aspect is there are secular movements all over the world questioning the very historicity of Jesus movement. And you might have heard of uh, historical Jesus research. And now it's gone to that extent of asking questions whether the Jesus movement was a myth or legend. Then what's our response? And of course, in, uh, in BD classes or master's classes or doctoral research, we probably deliberate those aspects. But when it comes in terms of the public and the church, there should be a clear answer based on our own reading of the New Testament. So the response from the biblical point of view and the questions about the historicity of Jesus movement. And the uh, uh, fifth aspect is the changing patterns of biblical hermeneutics. It's not fixed. It's like, you know, you, all of you have uh, specs. This is my fourth uh, uh, spectacle. Uh, after uh, taking the reading, after uh, taking the power, the fourth, it changes. Uh, biblical hermeneutics is more or less like that. Your own context, your own perspective, your own life experience will design and determine the principles of biblical hermeneutics. So changing patterns in biblical hermeneutics, the changing world order, themes that ecclesial or academic uh, scholars propose, and the response from the biblical point of view, and the questions about historicity of Jesus movement. I have uh, more or less decided not to mention names uh, because uh, all of us have contributed, have been contributing in many ways. But still I would like to mention four or five names at, at this point, uh, Biblical New Testament scholars, Dr. Tatka Imjen, who has initiated a lot of uh, studies uh, in the Northeast uh, region as well as in other regions. And uh, his point is you need to study the text well and do justice to the text, exegesis. And uh, there are uh, people like uh, Dr. Gay giving importance to the text, Dr. P.C. Gay and Dr. V.J. John and uh, Dr. Abraham Philip. There are many people, they're senior scholars, uh, text. Because uh, most of us who are sitting here uh, probably have gone through their own contributions and their own uh, understanding about the biblical scholars. And finally, the context uh, uh, that's, that's in, uh, the, within which we need uh, biblical, we, we are doing the biblical studies is religious education. We call it Christian education. Some churches we call church Sunday school uh, or uh, uh, youth. Uh, uh, movement or Bible study, whatever it is, but the religious education, what is the role of the New Testament and the Bible? That's the question we take. And with this context of uh, uh, biblical uh, New Testament reading, let me uh, point out major impacts and influences of New Testament reading uh, today. I think this is a bit technical. Uh, probably you can send email, Sugumar Babu will send uh, my email or WhatsApp to the members so that you can, we can continue our conversation. Uh, because these things, I try to uh, simplify it. I try to make it simple, as simple as possible uh, so that you will understand. Major influence 
that we face today is the flood of materials contributed by the Q scholarship. Q means saying materials uh, produced at the time of Jesus Christ. People like me believe there were written materials at the time of Jesus Christ. And there are research going on to find out whether it is in the 20s or early 30s, some materials, gospel materials were written. And the Q scholarship headed by Kloppenberg uh, and headed by Society for Biblical Literature and other scholarly bodies always looked for that aspect. And the Q studies will have a tremendous impact in the coming years of New Testament scholarship because Q scholarship directly deals with uh, what happened at the time of Jesus. How Jesus and the disciples recorded their own materials. How Jesus and his own associates, scholarly people like Joseph of Adamant and other friends, Lazarus, they were all scholarly people, educated people of that time whom, with whom Jesus had association. And the Q explores all those aspects very seriously. And uh, till recently, those materials were available to only the higher class people. If you are studying in Harvard or in uh, top universities in UK or Germany, you had access. Now you have access to all those materials if you have a smartphone. You can go to any, any of those materials and scrutinize them. Everything is available in simple English. And when you uh, lecture to your students and when you uh, pre do preaching in a congregation or when you conduct a Bible study, remember, your people and your audience might have gone through such materials. And they are aware of the, what's happening in the biblical scholarship. That's the first point of the second part of my presentation, the coming of Q studies. Second is the textual criticism, of course, which is a bit, uh, uh, again, you know, scratching the head. Some of you who have studied very well of course, Bishop Sharma was an outstanding student. <laughs> Probably he did not remember, I am sure, he won't remember uh, what happened in the textual criticism class taught by Dr. Carr. <laughs> because you remember, okay. <laughs> because um, it's a technical aspect. And when I applied uh, late 90s for a scholarship, they said, you know, Indians cannot do that such kind of materials because your basic knowledge is very low, <laughs> even without testing. Now, it is a monopoly of some schools in the West. I'm sure there are people listening to my lecture in U from UK, Australia, and US. Uh, see, you will probably agree with me, but now it is changing. It is changing because of the Bible Society uh, translation attempts, uh, because of the Senate of Sarambo translation attempts, because there are a lot of translations Bible translations happening in India and uh, other developing countries to take the scripture uh, to the ordinary people. So textual criticism is no more uh, uh, mono no more monopoly of higher class people or the elites, but it's uh, mandatory for any biblical scholar to have basic knowledge about uh, textual criticism. And the third aspect, which is again technical, which we need to know about uh, in order to understand the biblical scholarship is the archaeological studies uh, research. Lot of archaeological studies. Suppose you watch on Friday uh, late uh, 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 televising at uh, 10, 30 or 11 in National Geography. The prime time they will bring a uh, video of biblical archaeology. And uh, one of the videos I watched last year was uh, Jesus bought to a video show, telling you uh, they found or discovered or re rediscovered the boat that Jesus traveled. Of course, it's amazing to see that. It's available in the YouTube and you can see after my presentation. Such is the intensity of, of biblical archaeology. And you cannot ignore biblical archaeology and have uh, understanding about uh, New Testament uh, scholarship. And the Fourth and fascinating aspect is the contextual uh, reading methods. 
specifically contributed by our own country, uh, particularly <coughs> Indian scholarship. Indian scholarship very well contributed Dalit's uh, reading, tribal reading, Adivasi reading, womanist reading, feminist reading, and the Asian reading like Minchung and so on. So no biblical scholar across the globe can move forward without touching the contextual uh, biblical aspect. And now the subaltern readings and post-colonial readings are coming up. I'm sure Dr. Johnson Thomas Kuti will include some of those sessions in the coming uh, uh, lectures. And uh, finally, the most important influence that we need to, particularly the Indian uh, readers to understand is the influence of non-canonical materials. As canon for us, it's a set list of books. But there are hundreds, hundreds of books written at the time of canonization, first century books, second century books, third century books, and so on. So we cannot move forward without understanding the non-canonical materials. But the challenge that we face with the biblical teachers and the pastors or the preachers face is we mix up. We take some materials from non-canonical, some materials from canonical, and to cook up a story and present. And most of the skits that we presented during Christmas time, I always used to tell my students, is non-canonical. There is no, no uh, reference in the New Testament, particularly the Synoptic Gospels, but non-canonical. But you make it, happily we make it. But when you think about the real gospel message or core gospel message, you need to distinguish between canonical and non-canonical. And the gospel message uh, is clearly framed, written in the, in the uh, synoptic gospels as well as in the Johannine materials. So that's the second aspect. Let me repeat. One, the influence of Q studies. Second, the influence of textual criticism. Third, the coming of archaeological research. And fourth, the availability of contextual uh, and subaltern materials, and fifth, the non-canonical materials. And uh, a couple of years back, uh, I uh, was reading an article written by Francis Watson, and the heading of the article is, Who Owns the Bible? I once I asked that question to a batch of students at UGC, Who Owns the Bible? They said, uh, uh, if you have uh, uh, money, you can buy a Bible. Then someone brilliantly said, if you can interpret, you own the Bible. I think that's what the bishop mentioned in the beginning, and John Secretary also mentioned. If you are able to interpret the Bible, you own the Bible. So who owns the Bible? Your ability will decide. The ability to interpret will decide the ownership of the Bible. However, having said this, I should mention the scholarly bodies that's giving leadership in the field of biblical research. One is Society for Biblical Literature and uh, Interwar City Press and many other research and publishing houses. And the Indian scholars are in collaboration with uh, uh, those uh, scholarly houses and publishing houses and moving uh, forward. And this is the background. First part is the context. Second part is the influences. And I'm coming to the principles and methods of biblical interpretation. I've taken from my own book, probably you are familiar with it, Hermeneutics, Foundations and Trends. This is the book uh, I have uh, uh, written a couple of years back and uh, it is used as a textbook uh, for studying hermeneutics. This is also a platform to promote the book. <laughs> okay, so let me, let me just highlight uh, some of the very basic aspects of biblical uh, principles and methods of biblical interpretation. And uh, we, are, we need to be aware of the technical terms uh, in uh, interpreting the Bible. Technical terms like text, hermeneutics, exegesis, context, method, methodology, and so on. But one technical term that will never leave you is criticism. I think that's the most negative word I have ever seen, biblical criticism. But that criticism, that word gives you 
a holistic framework about the biblical scholarship in terms of interpreting the Bible. I read uh, the definition uh, uh, given to criticism in my book. Criticism refers to the science of treating biblical text as products of historical and political engagements between the people. Therefore, applying scientific tools to find out the meaning of the text. Meaning of the, finding out the meaning of the text is most important in a uh, biblical uh, reading. So why do you need principles and methods? Because the meaning of a text cannot be fixed once for all. And there is a specific meaning for every text, no doubt about that. However, you need to understand, you need to read, you need to reread uh, according to your own perception and your own conviction about uh, uh, your context so that you will get a fresh idea, fresh insight to move forward. When we talk about the methods and principles, methods and principles is not emerged overnight. It's not a single day emergence. It all began from the first century, at least to the early part of the second century uh, by the early fathers of the church. And the early fathers have contributed substantially in interpreting uh, the Bible and giving principles of biblical interpretation. And Gerald Bray uh, defines the hermeneutics, basics of hermeneutics of the early church in the following way. All the church bodies contain a wide spectrum, ranging from the most conservative to the most liberal. And as long as a particular issue does not affect the church order, there is usually a spirit of mutual tolerance, if not acceptance. That was the understanding of the early fathers, early teachers of the church in the uh, early part of the uh, biblical interpretation. And there are scholars like Anthony the Sultan, uh, who has analyzed, Anthony the Sultan has analyzed the biblical method, uh, stating systematic allegorization emerges in Gnosticism and in Clement of Alexandria, and in a particular sense, it to be discussed, and Oregon and uh, many other scholars. And we cannot move forward without reading some of those scholarly materials, because uh, we need to uh, distinguish Christianity from Judaism when we interpret New Testament and distinguish Christianity from Hellenistic philosophy and cults. You, you should not mix up. And uh, we need to define Christian God and the nature of Christ. And uh, early church, it was necessary for them to demonstrate how the Bible could and should be applied to the process of building up the church. I think we in India, we face that. When we interpret the Bible, we interpret the New Testament, we also connect that with the building up of the church. And uh, it is absolutely necessary uh, to maintain the unity of the church. And that was, that was the core of the uh, early interpretation of biblical studies. And come, then moving to the medieval exegesis. Medieval exegesis, we have writings of Jerome. The writings of Jerome are of lasting value to Christians today because they offer us a splendid example of the state of biblical interpretation in the West, in the fourth century, because they give us an interesting insight into relations between Christians and Jews in the generations after Christianity became the religion of the state. So it goes to Byzantine, it goes to Islamic civilization, then you have Latin West, and then revival of the West up to 1500 AD. And then slowly the imperial positions uh, infiltrated into the New Testament scholarship and the interpretation of the New Testament scholarship. And the Council of Basel, 1433, um, made the following observations. All scriptures inspired. Nothing that scripture definitely asserts can mislead. The teaching of scripture accords with God's goodness. 
scripture has many senses of which the literal is one these are all observations made by the council of basel there were a lot of confusion i think today 21st century when we take the bible when we say there are many interpretation there are many confusion in the whatsapp or in the social media uh, it's all because of uh, discussions and conversations and such conversations and discussions and debates happened in the 16th and 17th century so uh, there were scholars proposing new framework for biblical interpretation uh, sugu can i take another 10 minutes sugu can i take another 10 minutes yes please sir okay yeah. so histo historical critical method most of us studied at the bd level i uh, think those who have been gone through bd syllabus will know this when i present and the historical critical method say all works should be critically examined and uh, there are many manuscripts found but the most reliable manuscript to be uh, maintained early christian history was reconstructed with the help of socio historical studies and insights from the philosophy were to be carefully applied and then uh, the historical critical method basically takes textual criticism seriously and you might have heard of people like lightfoot westcott and hort a lot of people cambridge based people oxford based people who have contributed a lot but now textual criticism is done very well by in at the university of birmingham where myself and dr alex sudas uh, he completed recently a study and there uh, one david parker is doing lot of work in terms of uh, textual criticism and textual criticism deals with the style and vocabulary of the author throughout the book it uh, defines the immediate context and it explains the aramaic background of the teachings of jesus and it defines the influence of the christian community upon the formulation and transmission of the passage and these are some of the basics of uh, uh, textual criticism and then we have form criticism i don't want to explain it but uh, you should also uh, remember people like christopher tackett rowland they have contributed and then you have billy maxson uh, doing redaction criticism and then coming to the sociological criticism the present new testament scholars more or less uh, all of us including myself uh, have gone after sociological criticism it's because in the 1970s onwards sociological methods have made a tremendous impact in the asian academy as well as indian academy and you take any biblical scholar from asia or africa uh, any one who contributed substantially uh, will say sociological criticism helped us a lot there are two types of sociological uh, readers one is uh, one set of scholars will go for the pure sociology there is nothing pure sociology but they apply theory and then uh, they define the early church like uh, god taste will not mix up things but taisen uh, will pick up story and re uh, reconstruct things but there are scholars uh, like uh, uh, political readers political readers like lorry green and the tanjan car or many other people sugadaraja they will mix up, uh, the theories with the people's experience political experience cultural experience and uh, other social experiences so therefore the biblical methods and principles that we talk about uh, will definitely change should change you cannot simply take from the uh, from a scholar and say oh no this is the method i want to apply you cannot apply it's like you know you develop a password and set a password to enter into your own uh, uh, email so you need to develop everon but this is the survey i have category yes okay this is the method uh, the basic survey i have given then i am coming to the final 
part of my presentation why indian new testament reading why indian new testament reading indian new testament reading is not a new thing in the 1960s when society for biblical studies in india was formed uh, both by catholics and protestants and their primary intention was to promote biblical scholarship and bible partium one of the leading catholic journals uh, they have recorded documented all the papers biennial papers and it is available to us but at some point uh, the scholars uh, formed another uh, body called the catholic biblical scholarship in india but we work hand in hand and the next biennial of biblical uh, studies society for biblical studies in india will be in trivandrum october i'm sure the ecc seminar will definitely uh, invite more people uh, to the towards the biblical scholarship so that we will have a vibrant uh, spsi meeting a lot of books have been published a lot of articles have been published a lot of discussions and uh, churches like csi cni Matoma and other Orthodox churches and Catholic churches, even charismatic churches, uh, Presbyterian church, Baptist churches in Northeast India, all have taken biblical scholarship seriously and incorporated it into their own uh, biblical studies. And uh, you should not forget that there is a new wave of scholars coming up. And uh, Dr. Johnson, uh, Thomas Kuti, uh, and there are not a lot of people. Uh, so this, uh, uh, my own. Uh, doctoral students, my own doctoral graduates, they have published books and they're all setting new uh, trends. And uh, I uh, would like to finally propose five areas where the biblical, uh, New Testament biblical uh, scholars in India should focus. One is how best we can use New Testament in the uh, uh, study of Ecclesia. Defining or redefining Ecclesia, how best you can use New Testament uh, methods, you New Testament principles. Because you cannot distinguish uh, your uh, biblical scholarship from the Ecclesial scholarship. Because both should go hand in hand because of the specific Indian Ecclesial situation. And then most of the leading schools in India are run by the denominations. So, the governing council always uh, asked for biblical scholarship. And the Ecumenical Christian Center, when I was in Bangalore, I used to go to Ecumenical Christian Center every now and then. Most of the seminars will have a major biblical component. So you should not distinguish from the ecclesial uh, and the scholarly uh, material. So ecclesia redefined in the light of New Testament. Second uh, aspect I want to promote is in India, you should go for a mother tongue hermeneutics. Mother tongue hermeneutics. Of course, what the materials I have mentioned all written in English. Uh, and there are outstanding books published in Malayalam, Tamil, Telugu, Hindi, uh, and other languages, Canada, and other languages, and Northeast languages. And how best you can use the mother tongue hermeneutics? How best do you listen to the stories of the village people? How best do you listen to your grandmas about the biblical insights? And it's now a popular uh, reading strategy in Africa called the mother tongue hermeneutics, people's experience, and uh, the way they express in mother tongue. So I see that is the future of biblical uh, scholarship. A third aspect of biblical scholarship is the native scholarship. Native scholarship, including the forgotten voices of uh, native leaders, forgotten and ignored voices of the native leaders. There have been many native leaders assisting the missionaries, assisting the leaders, assisting the theologians, but their, their voices are not recorded. So in future, those things will uh, be taken into serious uh, consideration. And uh, next, next aspect, the fourth aspect is cultural hermeneutics will have a new space and opportunity in the Indian Academy, particularly when we talk about the methods and the uh, principles of biblical scholarship, there will be a lot of elements in the cultural hermeneutics. Finally, 
gender justice will be a major attraction, major focus in terms of biblical studies. Without the gender justice, you cannot go for the uh, biblical uh, scholarship. I have tried to say five things. One is the ecclesial framework and the New Testament scholarship. Second, the mother tongue scholarship, mother tongue hermeneutics. Third is the native, forgotten and ignored voices to be included. And fourth is cultural elements uh, to be incorporated. And finally, gender justice issues. And when we interpret the Bible, applying these principles and methods uh, make it relevant for the church and society and preserve the gospel values so that you will not add or delete rather you try to understand uh, that's why all these methods and principles may god bless you i'm sure there will be a lot of questions uh, coming up and uh, subumar babu will give you in my email or whatsapp so that you can uh, contact me or uh, uh, send the question. So we'll continue the conversation. Thank you very much once again. I congratulate and uh, thank uh, uh, sincerely the organizers and appreciate the organizers for this wonderful speaking. Thank you. Sir, thank you so much indeed for providing such a most brilliant and serious and creative presentation with the stunning patterns. Thank you so much indeed, sir. Thank you so much for broadening our thoughts to listen how best we can listen from our grandmas, how best we can listen from forgotten voices, how best we can take back those ignored voices to interpret today's contextual challenges. Thank you so much for all dynamic interpretations. Friends, I'm sure we have a lot of questions. More than 100 people, we are in pack now, many people calling me by phone from Taiwan, South Korea, Brazil, different parts of the world, they're telling me, Sukma, is there a chance to go? I told them, Facebook is on. Please tell them to connect on Facebook. And each person can ask one question, precise question, over to the floor. Please raise your hand or you can click reactions. We'll give you a chance. Yes. Sukumar, Dr. Jayasri. Dr. Jayasri, ma'am. Yes. Thank you so much. Appreciate you greatly for the presentation. It was such an excellent presentation, as always, of your scholarship. And uh, my uh, all what you have said. The things are really relevant for any New Testament scholars, any interpreters of the text, or anyone who is interested in learning the scripture. You have also connected something related in one section about archaeology. We know how limited we are with the materials related to archaeology and our, our access to us getting into archaeological uh, studies or New Testament and archaeology. Uh, do you think for our Indian scholars or for uh, uh, our forum in any way that we get some access or connection to New Testament studies and archaeology? Any way possible that we get into our students into New Testament studies and archaeology? Thank you. Uh, shall I respond? Yes, uh, I think uh, uh, this is a major concern for the past uh, three or four decades because uh, India is a vast country uh, with uh, hundreds of schools and uh, hundreds of scholars. And uh, some of us uh, uh, have been uh, trained uh, by leading schools and guided by leading scholars. But the problem is we uh, possess the scholarship and not ready to collaborate with uh, other scholars. Uh, in short, uh, my scholarship uh, will die with me. 
I'm not in a position to make a coordination of uh, uh, scholarship. I give two examples. If you take the last 60 years history, the most outstanding research in the field of textual criticism was Dr. John Philippos, who was with the Bible Society, uh, who published uh, an outstanding research material, but his name is nowhere in the biblical scholarship. He was in the Bible Society and taught for a few years at UTC, but his work was not recognized because there was no coordination, there was no promotion for his work. The remedy to what you have asked is, uh, there may be five scholars in your region. So Kerala region, uh, I think most of us do post-colonial studies and sociological studies and feminist studies. But if you find one person with the skills in archaeology and textual, incorporate to him or her in your conversation. I have four students that did uh, uh, the P completed PhD in the field of Revelation, Book of Revelation, Apocalypse. So I was clever. I asked one person to do the context of Babylonian exile so that I could learn. And he got PhD, Reverend uh, Dr. Uh, Solomon. Then Mayang came uh, with the same title. I said, no, Mayang, this is not, you do the cultural aspect of this. So I learned. So similarly, four people have done from the Book of Revelation area, four different uh, aspects, but got with the better coordination. So only remedy is, you get one or two people uh, from uh, Indian uh, Academy, get trained and make them to be part of our team. So the future of New Testament scholarship in India is a kind of team publication, team work, like what we do now, Luke, uh, you are writing an article in Luke, I'm writing in Acts, like that. So the team uh, presentation. So this is possible, provided if you are ready to take the expertise of everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. I saw a person with the name iPod. I don't know your name, sir. Would you please tell your name and ask question, please? Unmute, please. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, please, sir. Yes, my name is Mahbub. Uh, I'm originally from Pakistan, but I'm ministering in Scotland. So I'm speaking from Scotland now. Um, uh, correct me if I heard you uh, uh, wrong. Um, in your presentation, you said meanings are not fixed. Um, if meanings are not fixed, then um, how do you take authorial intention into account as you interpret the scriptures? Okay. Thank you. Thank you for uh, picking up the most controversial statement I have made. <laughs> Okay. See, the, 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 my New Testament is written in Greek, but uh, half of the original source behind the New Testament uh, came from Aramaic. That also not from the Polish Aramaic, but from the colloquial village Palestinian Aramaic. So what happened in that transmission, the original intention of a particular word uh, of course, the Greek translator might have kept the, the, the very meaning, but then it moves to the Latin, it moves to German, it moves to English, and then our own uh, Bible. In that process, there may be a kind of uh, flexibility happen. I'm carefully using the words, flexibility happen in terms of uh, understanding the meaning. So your understanding of the meaning of the text is not fixed. Understand? Uh, that is what I meant to say. So it's easy. You are my understanding. I cannot claim that uh, what uh, uh, is the meaning of uh, first chapter of Matthew, what I have understood is absolute. But the core remains same. I think I mentioned, I made two sentences. The second sentence uh, after that, I made that. It is there. So the, my own understanding cannot be fixed. So but then if that's the case, then... Uh, uh, what uh, great German and uh, public American uh, British scholars, scholars have done 18th and 19th century uh, will remain stagnant, absolute, final. Then uh, our job is just to buy heart and then do it. Of course, uh, the Scotland are you from Glasgow? 
so run me please okay <laughs> okay so i think i made it clear uh, so we 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 are sentients we develop our own specs our own framework to get the meaning legitimate as closer as possible to the original text thank you right okay yes okay thank you next person bennett lawrence sir yeah hello sir um hello brilliant brilliant uh, um in paper presentation thank you very much for presenting especially i liked the last five points that you mentioned and i think it will chart the course for the future hermeneutics uh, especially in new testament and it's very interesting and i just want to talk about this one thing you mentioned two aspects sir in your presentation one is being faithful to the uh, to the text and the second part is that the interpreters um being the owner of the text so when we have these two aspects when we have to be faithful to the text also interpreters owning the text and we have so many different methodologies where the interpreters do several interpretations uh you know, by the same time not being faithful to the text the quote and quote so how do you see that i know that we we have struggled with this point in liverpool and we struggled with these things in in the, in the workshops there so i just want to know your point well friends uh, dr bennett is uh, one of the very systematic writers and they have been publishing regularly in the field of new testament so his question and his concern we are uh, uh, fellow <laughs> uh, travelers and we have been struggling and uh, uh, to understand i uh, explain this with an example uh, during the lockdown last uh, two months three months i was trying to write a book uh, based on jude book of jude of course one chapter and i read the greek then i uh, uh, began to write the commentaries but lot of contradictions then i thought of course uh, uh, my knowledge greek knowledge is not perfect but still you know i uh, have a kind of confidence that i know greek but uh, to my surprise if you want to be faithful to the text you also need to consult at least all available original manuscripts fortunately i i had access to some of those manuscripts through my friends like uh, dr alexey swas and others uh, who are in europe and some of them sent some materials and we made some clarifications so uh, text be faithful to the text means be faithful to the most reliable text Uh, of course uh, spi text is there of course sorry spl text is there and uh, other sps uh, indian texts are there or bsi text is there but uh, what is your most reliable text the knowledge that you gain so if you can see my table i have kept to three versions malayalam english greek the first text i take is malayalam because that's my mother tongue but i know that the translation is not uh, from the original onward so i have to read greek so when i meant uh, faithful to the text enter into the most uh, uh, reliable text go as much as possible close up to the text of course if you are writing something on synoptics you also need to pick up brush up your aramaic otherwise you know you are doing uh, something beating around the bush that's why we feel uh, jealous to the western scholars because they say aramaic <laughs> so we don't know have access to aramaic but now the internet and the modern scholarship have given us those spaces thank you dr then i know your question is a compliment thank you thank you <laughs> thank you so much sir so there was a public question asked publicly about different dimensions of mother tongue hermeneutics sir can you please raise your hand one who asked about mother tongue hermeneutics you asked the question here any other person please father matthew thank you uh, very much uh, 
Reverend Dr. Joy, uh, David, David Joy for this wonderful uh, presentation. And since you have also written a book on this hermeneutics, I think you are the up person uh, to, for this inaugural uh, lecture. So I have been pursuing uh, Indian philosophical systems and then I have found so much of richness. Perhaps um, it might be uh, to, to some extent, uh, we could say that, you know, this is coming from uh, the uh, oppressive uh, structures, but uh, very, very meaningful uh, philosophical ideas are there. And even um, if, if we look into the interpretations of Bible, we see that so much of Greek philosophy and um, uh, the, uh, from Aristotle, some Plato, and uh, even in contemporary times, we have seen that so much taken from Heidegger, uh, Meister Eckhart, and then um, so many other philosophical systems. So therefore, um, uh, why can't we take from our own uh, rich traditions, which you have already said that, you know, various uh, ways of tribal and many uh, other traditions. So uh, uh, our own categories like, you know, guru and then many uh, other uh, such rich and meaningful. Um, so why don't uh, like you uh, biblical theologians take up uh, that issue into more uh, with more prominence? Thank you, Father. I think knowing the uh, historical developments in terms of uh, using philosophical uh, schools for biblical interpretation, you have stated, uh, made this statement. There was a link between United Theological College and Thamara College for about uh, four decades. Very strong link, uh, particularly in terms of developing biblical uh, hermeneutics and the theological uh, streams, Indian Christian theology. Uh, but the late 90s, unfortunately, that generation of scholars have retired or uh, they moved from Bangalore. Then they could not or did not uh, uh, push it further. Uh, that's probably a, a mistake uh, from our part. Of course, uh, the other uh, uh, criticism has been always uh, is there. It's about democracy, but I'm not going for that. But we need to have the richness of our tradition, our folk tradition, our Dalit tradition, our own Indian philosophical tradition, for which you need not a scholarship. If I know only Greek, I do not do not know my native language. Then how will I how will I uh, communicate? Sister Prema Vakail uh, used twenty reading, twenty reading uh, to interpret John's Gospel, and there are Buddhist readings. Mahayana readings in John's Gospel, and there are attempts from the Indian side. I'm sure uh, whether Gujarat Sahitya Academy, I think uh, that uh, publisher or Jesuit publishers, or uh, uh, Delhi bound Vijaytia, uh, Vijay Jodi Journal, uh, their publications will take initiative to rekindle uh, this. I think this is a very valid uh, thing, but for which uh, we need uh, uh, people who know philosophy. Who know Indian tradition, who know folk tradition, who, who are well versed with uh, Dalit traditions, Adivasi traditions, and so on. Father, but uh, the researchers from the Northeast India now brilliantly link with biblical scholarship and tribal scholarship. I think that's a silver line. And uh, to our surprise, my prediction is there will be at least two dozen outstanding world level books will be published from the uh, no, researchers from Nagaland, Mizoram, Manipur, uh, and that region uh, compiling biblical scholarship with uh, their own uh, linguistic thing. Because some of them are working with me. I know how best they use uh, their traditions. So, so also from other parts of India, probably we'll have a better. But thank you very much. That's a very valid uh, observation. Thank you so much, sir. Especially when you spoke about uh, Nagaland. Uh, Northeast. One question uh, comes from Cheming Tingla Songtam. Go to Cheming Tingla Songtam, please. Unmute, please, and raise your question. Thank you so much, sir, for the insightful presentation that you have done. I have 
I am so much impressed with the proposal that you have made in the computing part, especially the five areas of research. So, sir, um, regarding the mother tongue hermeneutics, I would like to get more insights. Whether this mother tongue hermeneutics relates with the languages that we are going to use, or what are some of the things that we will be incorporating in the mother tongue hermeneutics? Sir, can you please help me? Thank you. Okay. Uh, well, uh, it is not a literal expression that uh, the mother tongue hermeneutics, rather uh, it is a uh, heart-to-heart uh, reflection uh, in the light of your experience and in the light of uh, what is closer to your culture. So, but it is different from the cultural hermeneutics. Cultural hermeneutics will take uh, uh, four or five institutions seriously like uh, politics and other institutions. Whereas mother tongue will basically deal with the anthropological and sociological fluctuations and dynamics in one community. It's more specific. It's more uh, associated with the basic uh, uh, dimensions of a, a community. Like, you know, Jesus, uh, at some point, Jesus uh, uttered uh, in mother tongue, Halida Kumi, Lama Shabadani, then the translators did not go for Greek. They kept uh, Aramaic. Similarly, we also do the same thing. We have our own expression coming from our own specific local context. I hope you have understood. I think it's yet to be developed. Uh, as far as my knowledge goes, Ghana, uh, Nigeria. There are two or three schools, uh, Kenya. Uh, St. John's University, St. Catholic University, by uh, Esther Mombo. They have developed this. But otherwise, uh, it's a new area where we Indians uh, should link with our own specific context and expressions in terms of understanding biblical scholarship. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. It was so enriching, very interactive, very interdisciplinary. Thank you so much, indeed, Professor Reverend Dr. David Joyce, sir. Uh, friends, we have another hero of this series. He's the real architect behind this creative modules of series. Uh, let me introduce Reverend uh, Dr. Johnson Thomas Kuti. Johnson Thomas Kuti is a professor of New Testament from Union Biblical Seminary, Pune. He has done PhD from Netherlands, postdoctoral research and uh, he published a number of articles, a number of books around the world. Professor Dr. Johnson Thomas Kuti, as I said, he is the real architect, real hero to design such a creative series of 22 scholarly online webinars. He has done a lot of hard work. He's the most brilliant designer. He's the person with ecumenical outlook, all honor goes to Professor Dr. Johnson Thomas Kuti. Single-handedly, he called all people to design this series of wider contextual biblical hermeneutics. Therefore, I invite Professor Dr. Johnson Thomas Kuti to give concluding remarks. Hello, friends. Uh, this is a wonderful occasion and opportunity uh, we as a team, under the leadership of Father Matthew Chandra Gunnail, uh, Reverend Sugumar, Mr. Minlun, and under the leadership of uh, Ecumenical Christian Center, and with the full support of the Church of South India, uh, organizing this series of lectures. As we have heard, Reverend Dr. David Joy firmly affirmed that Indian biblical scholarship is or was unique and peculiar. A wider contextualized biblical hermeneutics without the boundaries of caste, class, color, gender, nationality, denominational bias, is the dream for us to cherish. 
the message of the new testament has to be integrated in pluriform context so that we may have a jesus centered culture centered people centered and a land centered interpretation many readings are there but context is the key influence of non canonical materials as dr david joy rightly mentioned is very important and the mother said the principles have to be okay further developed so many scholars have already paved ways but we have to further develop that one step was taken at the forefront by dr david joy to give you, give us some introductory aspects so biblical criticism does not okay as we think it is simply criticizing the bible but rather appreciating the text its meaning its setting its character characterization point of view plot development thematic aspects literary procedures and the critical historical underpinnings behind the text are the key factors to be taken up so finally dr david joy has stated that five important aspects using new testament in the study of ecclesia mother tongue hermeneutics native scholarship there we have to take up forgotten or ignore the issues of the uh, native leaders cultural hermeneutics and gender justice so at the inaugural session uh, some of the key figures like uh, advocate fernandes retina raja and vishap sharma and uh, reverend uh, dr david joy were key figures so now i am going to give you some structural aspects how we are going to proceed from here after is that today there were 100 members who attended this seminar but there were more than 50 plus okay staying outside they were asking for entry but we were not able to give them a space in a way that was unfortunate but we may find something okay technically applicable and convenient from next time on board ecumenical christian center is keen in awarding certificates for the participants who completes the 22 modules those who wanted to register a form is available if you provide your emails at the chat box so we will send you the registration form and you can register for the 22 sessions so the, from next lecture onward the presenter shall give you some minimum assignments maybe some questions answering some okay uh, things those should be very minimal not okay herculean but you are not charged for any of these lectures this is freely accessible for all that is a provision from ecumenical christian center so some of our forthcoming resource persons are uh, here just like uh, dr taka temchanao dr edwin jabraj dr pradap gayan dr mayang dr benet lorenz dr jayesri and many others so thank you for being part of this some of the participants are from pakistan from nepal from myanmar from bangladesh and from different parts of the world thank you for attending and uh, it is our privilege and honor to serve the community with uh, a passion okay from our lord jesus christ so thank you for this opportunity to serve you so from here after we are going to have the next lecture on thursday 18th of june 6 pm dr brand windel is going to be the uh, a speaker so may god bless all of us thank you for the good time thank you
Thank you so much, Professor Dr. Johnson Thomas Kutiso, for your profound concluding remarks. I sincerely thank all of you for your time and for your patience. Special word of thanks to our director, Father Matthew Chandran Punil, for these creative and brilliant lectures. Friends, as Sir already said, please give your emails. We will send the registration form to you. And the next uh, webinar will be June 18th. Kindly join for this webinar.